Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us this morning. I hope you've been enjoying the first campus offerings for our first ever virtual homecoming. My name is Corey Cunningham. Uh, I'm a graduate of the evening and weekend MBA program. I uh, actually just graduated in 2020, so I got the start of the COVID experience with Haas. <laughs> and uh, I also serve as the co-chair for the Berkeley Haas Alumni Council. Today, we are thrilled to have Terrence O'Dean here to speak to you about decision-making surrounding investment trading. At the conclusion of his talk, we will have a bit of time to address your questions. Um, there's a chat box in YouTube, so please be sure to write in your questions as they come to mind in the YouTube chat. And now it is my distinct privilege to introduce Terrence O'Dean. Terrence is the Rudd Family Foundation Professor of Finance at the Haas School of Business. As an undergraduate at Berkeley, he studied judgment and decision-making with the 2002 Nor Nobel Laureate in Economics, Daniel Kahneman. He went on to earn both a master's and PhD from our Haas School of Business. And he's also an advisory editor of the Financial Planning Review, a member of the Journal of Investment Consulting Editorial Board, and is a Wall Street Journal expert panelist. In 2016, he received the James R. Vertin Award from the CFA Institute for research notable for its relevance and enduring value to investment professionals. Thanks for being here, Terrence, and I'll hand it over to you. Hi, thanks, Corey. Uh, well, welcome to Homecoming Weekend, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk today about some of the research I've been doing in investor behavior. A long time ago, Benjamin Graham said that the investor's chief problem, even his worst enemy, is likely to be himself. And a lot of the research that I've done on uh, individual investors shows that they do make uh, systematic errors that... Uh, hurt their performance. Today, I'm specifically, I'm going to talk about one aspect of uh, decision making by investors. Let me start off by sharing my screen here. There. So I'm going to talk today uh, uh, oops, about a paper that I'm writing with uh, two friends and colleagues, Brad Barber and uh, Shengo Lin. And it's called Mediating Investor Attention. And this, the paper started, uh, well, basically, Brad and I wrote a paper several years ago. And what we we're trying to understand is how individual investors choose the stocks that, that they choose to buy. This is, what we recognize is that there's a huge search problem for an investor who just says, I want to buy a stock today. There are four or 5,000 stocks to choose from. That's, that's vastly more than, than you can give consideration to. So, and, and human beings have limited attention. You, you know, you, we don't have the time or the attention to think about 500 or 5,000 different stocks. So what we thought probably happened uh, for most investors is they choose from the subset of stocks that catch their attention. For example, suppose that my uh, co-author Brad and I are two investors. And on a particular day, we both see the same dozen stocks mentioned. Maybe they're on the front page of the Wall Street Journal or on some, you know, uh, we read about them uh, or hear about them on, on television or something. But we're both thinking about the same 12 stocks out of the four or 5,000 that are out there. And let's say that Brad is a Graham and Dodd style investor. He cares about fundamentals. He's taught accounting courses before, so he knows how to dig in and uh, evaluate a company. And we'll say I'm a uh, momentum investor. I believe that what goes up goes up. So Brad looks at these 12 stocks. He finds one that maybe has been out of favor for a while. It's got sound fundamentals. It appeals to him. He buys it. I look at the same 12 stocks. I find one that's had positive earnings surprises for the last three or four quarters. And that appeals to me and I buy it. So our beliefs and preferences do influence our choices. But attention takes the choice set from several thousand down to a manageable number. In my example, a dozen. And then our preferences and beliefs enter in. So what that's going to mean for individual investors is that if a stock catches the attention of many, many investors on a particular day, many of them will end up buying it. 
it, you know, it's not going to appeal to all of them, but the fact that that it's under consideration makes it uh, much more likely to be purchased. This isn't so true on the sell side. In the studies that I've done and I've done with Brad, we've looked at uh, trading records from brokerage accounts. And we find that on average, the investors own three or four different stocks. So if you own three or four different stocks and you want to sell something, you don't have an attention problem. You, you look at your four stocks and say, do I want to sell A, B, C, or D? Most likely, if you're like other people, you're going to sell something for a gain so that you can feel good about the transaction. And the tendency to sell your winners more often than your losers is referred to as the disposition effect, something I've studied in uh, other, other papers. It's a, it's a very, very robust uh, finding that people have looked at it all over the world and in different asset classes. And in the selling case, Say if it's December and you are thinking about your taxes, maybe you'll sell one of your stocks for loss. But the important thing is attention isn't going to drive what you buy or what you sell because you, the vast, vast majority of investors only sell stocks that they already own. They don't short sell stocks that, that they don't own. So attention is going to matter a lot for buying, less so for selling. And that means that when stocks get the attention, grab the attention of individual investors, and those investors are gonna be on the buy side of the market. Not simply that volume will go up, but that it's going to be buy, that they're gonna be placing many more buys than sells. What about institutional investors? Well, first of all, institutional investors effectively have more attention. Institutional investors spend all day dealing with the market, looking at their portfolios. They tend to work in teams. They're much more likely to have computers that they're using to support their decision-making. And furthermore, they own larger portfolios. So attention could matter a little bit there. Uh, and many institutional investors sell short. You know, hedge funds uh, often will sell stocks that they don't own. And so for them, the, uh, the universe of stocks that they're buying and selling from uh, is, is pretty much the same. At the very end of this talk, I will show you uh, a, a slide from uh, a paper that one of my colleagues at Haas uh, recently wrote that, that shows that attention matters for institutional investors as well, but less so. All right. So when does a stock attract an individual investor's attention? In our earlier paper, we came up with three proxies for attention grabbing events. One is when the trading volume is high and we figure, well, if trading volume is abnormally high, people must be paying attention to the stock. It's, it's tautological. Second, we said, well, what if the stock went down a lot or up a lot the day before? Extreme moves were, we thought would be likely to attract attention. And finally, we looked at whether uh, a stock was um, in the in the news. So, what we what we uh, expect to happen when a stock attracts attention is that trading volume will go up, the individual investors will be on the buy side of the market, and for smaller capitalization uh, stocks, stocks that might be influenced by individual investors, the stock price would go up and probably come back down. So again, our proxies for attention are high abnormal trading volume, extreme price moves, and news. So in our paper, we had a fairly simple theoretical model. And this is from a simulation based on the, the theoretical model. And the horizontal, I'm going to show you a number of graphs that are laid out like this. So let me take a moment and explain. The horizontal axis, in this case, we're sorting on volume. So it'd be high, higher than usual volumes on the right, lower than usual volume on the left. The vertical axis is what we call order imbalance. It's the number of purchases minus the number of sales divided by purchases plus sales. So the higher it is, the more the investors are placing buy orders rather than sell orders. So this was the the prediction when you sorted on abnormal trading volume from our uh, theoretical model. 
we looked at three different brokerage firms. We had data from three different brokerage firms, uh, 66,000 investors at a large discount brokerage firm, 670,000 investors at a large retail brokerage firm, and 14,500 at a small discount firm. And as you can see, the pattern that we see here is you go from low abnormal volume to high abnormal volume, just almost monotonically, the, uh, the buy sell imbalance goes up. In individual investors at these brokerage firms are more and more on the buy side of the market. And these are daily sorts. So we're sorting on daily on trading volume on a particular day and, uh, and on the percent imbalance that day. So this is from our paper. We've subsequently gone back and used transactional data from a database called the TAC database where we can identify uh, trades likely made by individuals or institutions over an 18 year period. And we find a very, very similar pattern. That's the blue line. This is now the trades uh, made by individual investors. But all that happens as you add years of data and more and more investors is the line just gets steadier and steadier. The yellow line is institutional trades. During this period, trades of over $50,000. So you don't see that pattern at all. Uh, and that's, this is, again, daily sorts. And when we instead use a week as the time period for measuring abnormal volume and trading imbalance, we get a very similar uh, finding. Now, our second proxy for uh, attention is big moves, like strong negative or positive returns on the previous day. So here we're sorting in our theoretical model, we're sorting stocks based on the previous day's return. And our prediction is that the buy sell imbalance is going to go up for extreme losers and extreme winners. When we go to the individual uh, brokerage account data, we find a pattern very much like our theoretical prediction. When we look at the transactions data over 18 years, again, we find a pattern very much like our theoretical prediction, both at the daily and the weekly horizon. And the institutional investors have, if anything, a slightly opposite pattern. And finally, when we sort stocks, either daily or weekly on abnormal news, we find that as the, a stock that's getting more news than usual has more investor, individual investors on the buy side and slightly fewer uh, institutional investors on the buy side. So that was the paper uh, that, that sort of set up, um, it was one of the early papers in finance on, on the importance of attention. And we got this very strong result that when individuals were, probably, were likely to be paying attention to a stock, they were on the buy side of the market. In that paper, we basically talked about salience as, as what drove uh, investors' attention. And so to get an idea of salience, look at, look at this uh, slide here. And which box stands out? clearly the red box, your eyes drawn to the red box. And you might say, well, that's because it's red and red is salient. But actually, now you, your eyes are drawn to the black box. So salience isn't driven by redness, it's driven by something that stands out from its background, stands out from its environment. Uh, so those are both examples of salience. But what about this? This isn't a salient box, this is just the only box that you see, just as that's the only box that you see. So when I was writing about, um, actually, it's part of my dissertation I was writing about overconfidence. And I wrote that investors overweight, salient, uh, anecdotal, and extreme information. 20 years later, I, thought, I looked at that, I thought, well, I really meant was that investors overweight salient, salient, and salient information. Since anecdotal information tends to be salient, extreme information tends to be salient. But today I think I had things slightly wrong. I think mostly what investors overweight depends on media coverage, media coverage, and media coverage. And that, that's what I wanna talk about today. I think that what really matters is 
Does a stock get covered or mentioned by the media or not? And if it is, then how prominently is it displayed? Is it front page news, back page news? Where does it show up? So how does the media choose what to cover? Media probably covers salient news, important news. That's the journalistic, that's its journalistic mission. Entertaining stories. The media, you know, you got to write things that are entertaining. Um, uh, many years ago, uh, I, I, a, a journalist took me to lunch and um, his job was every month to write a article about mutual funds. And every month he came up with a different list of uh, mutual funds. Um, and uh, I, I was talking to him, I said, well, the people that you're writing for, they, they should really just be buying and holding low cost index funds. And he smiled and said, that's true, but that does not sell my magazine. So entertaining stories. Or maybe the story wasn't that entertaining, but uh, the journalist or the, the, uh, the, the uh, TV network or the, somebody made the story entertaining. They figured out how to present it in an entertaining fashion. The media also does a lot of re-reporting. I, I learned that also. I, I got um, a call from the Wall Street Journal about a paper I'd written on disposition effect as part of my dissertation. And, and uh, a, a guy, J.W. Browning said he was going to write a column in, in the Heard on the Street, Heard on the Street column about it. And so I talked to him, the column comes out and the next day I get calls from CNBC and uh, from other uh, newspapers and that basically people re-reporting what was in the Wall Street Journal. There are also an uh, interesting phenomenon is, is arbitrary cutoffs on lists. And I'll give an example of that uh, in a few minutes. But you see a lot of top 10 lists. And the interesting thing is the difference between what happens to the top 10 and what would have been number 11 uh, on such lists. Paid advertising, that's another way that things up, end up in the newspaper or on TV. And then public relations stock, you know, sometimes uh, stories are just promoted by the company themselves. I'm not going to go through these. This is sort of the traditional uh, lit review slide. Uh, there are papers on increased aggregate trading volume around attention grabbing events. There are papers about return reversals where stock price goes up and then, and then comes back down around an attention grabbing event. I'm gonna show you some examples of those in a moment. And then papers showing that the buy sell imbalance of individual investors changes. Uh, the names are intentionally small because I don't expect you to read, read them right now. I wanna start instead with a story uh, the story uh, was written up in a paper by Huberman and Regev uh, in 2001, and it's about the company Entremed and the Entremed stock. So in November, on November 28, 1997, there was an uh, article in Nature magazine about potential cures or treatments for cancer. And there was a promising treatment that, that was being developed. And the article mentioned Entremed, a, a private list, a listed company, and said that Entremed was involved in this research and had some rights to the, um, to the, to the technique if it, it, it worked out. And what's graphed here is the price of Entremed. And you can see there was a little bit of a bump in the price uh, uh, as, around the time that the Nature article came out and then things stayed pretty flat. On May 4th, oh, it's also worth mentioning that the New York Times covered, the New York Times did do reporting of reporting. They had an article about the Nature, uh, with the information from the Nature article, but it was buried in back pages and you know probably second or third section. On May 4th, uh, a Sunday, the New York Times published a front page article that basically repeated the information in the, in the, uh, the Nature article from five months earlier. 
no, no new news in the May 4th article. The next day, the stock price went absolutely through the roof. It, it shot from around uh, the equivalent uh, from $12 up to over $50. Dropped down the, a day later, though only about halfway down, and then slowly fell over the next several months. So this is in Huberman and Regev's paper. Uh, my co-authors and I went back to see what individual and institutional investors were doing around this event. And what we found was that individual investors, these are the cumulative buys by, by uh, small trades uh, during this time period. So it's the accumulating the number of buys minus the number of sells. And it's a little hard to see, but there was a tiny blip on November 28th. Things stay pretty flat. And the day after that uh, New York Times article came out, the individual investors bought around $15 million worth of uh, Intramed. Over the next week, they bought another $5 million. And then they basically held for the rest of the period that we're looking at for the next six months or so. What about the uh, institutional investors? Pretty much the opposite. The institutional investors, again, it's a little small to see, but they slightly sold when the Nature article came out. They sold big time when the New York Times article came out and they continued to sell as the individuals continued to buy. And this is only, Clearly only one example, uh, but in this particular case, I think it's clear that the small traders ended up being the losers and the large traders were the winners in this story. So that's, that's one example of how where, it's not the news, it's where the news is covered. Nature, just doesn't shake the, the markets the same way the French page and the New York Times does. There's, along these lines, a paper um, by Engelberg and Parsons. And they looked at local newspapers and the local newspaper covering of uh, S&P 500 stocks and whether they had earnings announcements. And they used the uh, large uh, discount brokerage data that um, I mentioned in one of my earlier slides, and they looked to see whether there was less trading by investors in areas where the local newspaper didn't cover a particular earnings announcement. And sure enough, that's what they found. Now, one might say, okay, that makes a certain amount of sense, though. The, uh, say, say the investors who are reading the Minneapolis um, Tribune they may be more interested in uh, local stocks, agricultural stocks, something more local, and that's why it gets covered. So it, it might just be that the newspaper is covering what, the, what its readership is interested in. So the one clever thing that uh, Engelberg and Parsons did is then they went and looked at, situa at, at days in which the blizzards or it's extreme weather knocked out uh, newspaper coverage in some cities, but not others. And sure enough, they found the same effect that if, a, uh, if there was an earnings announcement covered by the local newspaper, but didn't get delivered because of the weather, the local investors didn't trade that stock, but the investors in cities where the newspaper was delivered, they did trade that stock more. Again, it's the media attention that seems to be driving stock trading. I mentioned lists before. Uh, here's a paper by Keneal and uh, Parham where they look at the Wall Street Journal category kings. These are lists of top mutual funds that the uh, Wall Street Journal publishes. And they look at inflows into mutual funds that were on the list or just missed being on the list. And sure enough, you know, the top fund gets the most flows and it, it drops down uh, monotonically as you go down the list. But then there's a big gap between 10 and 11 because 11 didn't show up in the paper. I don't know how many uh, older alum alumni we have today. I, I, for one, am old enough to have read the Wall Street Journal's dartboard column, uh, which was discontinued many years ago. 
Some of you will remember this. The Wall Street Journal would periodically ask four experts. They might, financial advisors, analysts, money managers. They would ask four experts to recommend one stock. And then the journal uh, editors would throw darts at a list of stocks and they would pick four stocks. So he had four stocks picked by the experts, four stocks picked by darts. This, usually this would appear in the bottom, uh, I think right-hand corner of the front page of the Wall Street Journal. There were little uh, bios about the four experts, nice little etchings of their faces. So, you know, it was an entertaining, um, entertaining column. And several months later, everyone knew you'd find out how the experts did and how the darts did. Uh, Brad Barber, my good friend and uh, uh, co-author, co wrote a paper on this. And uh, John Nofsinger also. I've got the graphs from, no from Nofsinger's later paper. It basically shows that the after the column came out, uh, the stocks picked by the experts tended to go up. Oops, didn't want that yet. Tended to go up, they had a bounce and then they trailed back down. Uh, so this is this price increase with attention with the reversal. We've gone back and looked at what investors were doing around these events. And here we have small trades in red and the blue, blue is the institutional trades. And here, the, the peak here, that's the day that the uh, article, the, the dartboard game column gets published. And sure enough, you see individual investors are way on the buy side of the market when the column comes out and they're, they stay pretty much on the buy side of the market throughout the rest of the week, though progressively less so. The institutional investors, institutional investors aren't buying and selling stocks based on the dartboard game. There's no, there, there's no response whatsoever. One thing that is somewhat reassuring though is that the, this graph above, that is the reaction of the stocks chosen by the experts in terms of what, what, rather what the individual investors were doing around those stocks. The individual investors did not go out and buy the stocks chosen by the darts. So um, when, you know, there was some, some sense, at least that much sense to their action, but they were basically buying stocks recommended by experts who had probably, there was no news in these, column, in, in, in these columns. People, the experts were recommending things they'd probably been recommending to their clients for a week or two. Uh, all the information they gave was well known, but there was still a reaction by individuals. Some of you will also remember uh, Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser. That was a weekly, it ran oh, for 30 years or so. Um, on PBS every Friday night, it was about Wall Street and experts would come in and often there would be recommendations. And sure enough, the stocks recommended on Wall Street week had a price increase the following week and then subsequently declined in price. Now, some of you guys are going to know Kramer. And Bernanke is being an academic. It is no time to be an academic. It is time to get on the Bear Stearns call. Listen, open the darn Fed window. He has no idea how bad it is out there. He has no idea. He has no idea. Corey, were you able to hear that? Yes or no? Yes. Lots Great. <laughs> okay. So just want to make sure the sound was working. All right, some of you know Kramer, Jim Kramer. Kramer, in my opinion, is an example of creating salience. He takes, he doesn't, it's not simply uh, just the facts, ma'am, I just want the facts. Kramer takes a stock, he talks about it, he gets excited, uh, people watch it because it's entertaining. Do they take it seriously? Do you think anyone buys what Kramer recommends? And Burnett oh, turns out they do. Uh, another paper, uh, Engelbert, uh, Sassville, and Williams. What do they find? They find that there are big overnight returns after Kramer recommends something and substantial reversals. Uh, both the returns and reversals are much bigger for smaller stocks and illiquid stocks where individual investors are likely to make a difference in their trading. We went and took a look at the 
retail trading around uh, Kramer recommendations. And sure enough, there's a huge spike in the buy sell imbalance uh, when Kramer recommends something and then it tapers back off. Uh, another another uh, proxy for attention is Google search volume. So these days you can go, Google makes it public. You can look to see how much, uh, well, any term, but you can see how much investors or, or people are searching for different stocks. And Eng, uh, Da Engelberg and Gao looked at price movements around, uh, they, they sorted stocks based on Google search volume. So you, I'll show you here. So on the left, there's lower than usual search volume for a stock. On the right, there's much higher than uh, usual search volume for stock. The blue line is from their paper. And that's, it's, it's slightly updated, but it's basically what they show in their paper is that the returns, the more search volume there is for a stock, the higher the contemporaneous returns. We add the red line in here. What's the red line? That's the retail order imbalance. The, the small investor, are they on the buy side or the sell side of the market? They tend to be on the sell side of the market for stocks that have low abnormal uh, search volume and very much on the high side of the market. So what we think is going on is that buying by these investors, buying the stocks that's catching their attention is driving the stock prices up. Finally, I promised you a, um, I talked a little bit about institutional investors. And this is from a paper um, Anastasia Fadik wrote. She is a, an assistant professor at the Haas School, uh, great colleague, great researcher. Uh, what she's doing in this paper is, it's, it's very interesting. She takes a look at the Bloomberg newsfeed uh, which is something that virtually all institutional investors um, have. And there's a feature to the Bloomberg news feed that works like this. Bloomberg editors look at each news article and they classify it as uh, important two, two layers of it. It's either primary importance or secondary news. So, and if it's the primary importance, like the, the, the top news stories, they, they, they put it on the front page of the B Bloomberg feed. And there are three stocks on that front page. And the stock stays there until it gets rotated off when a new top, uh, top important story replaces it. However, there's an interesting feature, which is if a stock's been on that front page uh, beyond a certain amount of time, then it automatically rotates off. And if there's not a new top story to take its place, then the next secondary news story to come down, come down the pipe gets pinned to that front, uh, front page. So it's arbitrary which secondary news stories get pinned to the front page. It's just, if, if it's the story coming, you know, the next one in line when a, uh, a top story rotates off, then it ends up on the front page. Otherwise, it's a little harder to see and access. So Anastasia looks at these secondary stories and takes a look at the price reaction. She classifies the stories based on whether there was a positive or negative uh, price reaction. But what she's really interested in is the speed. So the solid blue line here, the solid blue line is positive news that was on the front page, but second, these are secondary news stories. So this wasn't what the editors deemed the most important news. And it's how fast the price reacts. So you've got two minutes, four minutes, six minutes, eight minutes. And it turns out that easily within an hour, maybe even, yeah, within an hour, all of the upward move from that positive news is over and the uh, stock price stays basically flat for the next 15 days. Pretty much the same thing for negative news. It drops, it drops, it drops. And after an hour, all the impact is into the news. The dotted line are secondary news stories that never got pinned to the front page. 
So they were not as prominently displayed. And what you see there is the initial reaction, positive or negative, is much less. And then the stock price, if it's positive news, drifts up and up and up for the next 15 days or down and down and down if it's negative news for the fifth, next 15 days. So it appears that even institutional investors are being significantly influenced by how prominently information is, uh, is displayed. Finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Robinhood. I'm writing a paper with uh, Brad and a couple of the co-authors about uh, Robinhood. And um, many of you, I, I suspect most of you know that Robinhood is a uh, brokerage firm that has innovated in a couple of ways. First of all, it was, I believe the first firm to have zero commissions. And secondly, trading on Robinhood, is, the Robinhood app is very simple and it's very easy to trade. As part of working on this paper, I opened up a Robinhood account so I could live the experience. It's remarkable how easy it is. Just you pick, you click, you, you buy. And, but what, what we're interested in, in this paper is how information is displayed at Robinhood. And while a lot of brokerage firms uh, su supply investors with a great deal and a density and breadth of information, the information on Robinhood is fairly limited. And what's prominently displayed is a list of 20 top movers, stocks that had big, big moves up or down that day. So what, one thing we think is going on is that Robinhood users have their attention funneled to a fairly small list of uh, very active stocks each day. Other things going on is that half of the Robinhood users are first time investors. So they are not particularly experienced. They tend to be somewhat younger. Uh, there are a lot of them. As of May, there were 13 million. There were more Robinhood users than Schwab users. A lot less money but more actual users. So I'm just gonna show you a couple slides. Uh, uh, the first two are just examples, anecdotes. They, they're illustrative, but you know, there's no statistical significance in a sample of one. So we won't get too excited, uh, but then I'll show you what we're seeing when we look at a much larger sample. So what we have here is an event around Kodak stock price and the uh, the green line is Kodak stock price. The blue line is how many Robinhood users own Kodak. And what you can see is uh, over a very short time, a uh, couple, couple day periods, basically a one day period here, Kodak stock price shot up from, uh, 10, from about 10 to $40. Uh, the price is on the right hand axis. Oops, that's not what I want to do. Uh, and it, Contemporaneous with that, you see that more and more and more, a whole bunch of people at Robinhood bought Kodak. The price dipped a bit, came back a bit. The Robinhood users were still buying. Uh, you see the price declined dramatically. Well, actually it went from under $5 to over 40 and then came back down to about 10. And the number of users went from very few up to about 130 and uh, at the end of the period, there were about 100,000, most of whom had bought in at much higher prices than what you see at the end of the period. Uh, similar thing with Hertz. Hertz, it was, a, it was a somewhat unusual situation where Hertz had declared bankruptcy and its stock price suddenly rallied uh, from about a dollar uh, up, up to over $6. And that coincided with a lot of people buying Hertz at Robinhood. Hertz's price went back down and the uh, Robinhood users continued to own it. So probably not a very good outcome, at least for the Robinhood users who were later in the game coming on, uh, buying in. So those are two examples. Uh, my last graph, this is looking at, um, a 4,800, 4,800 events, uh, less dramatic, but a lot more, you know, we have statistical significance here. We're looking again at the stock prices. We're sorting on stocks that had big 
that each day we look at the stocks in the top one half of a percent of um, in terms of, of buying by uh, Robinhood users. So it's built in that there's going to be a big spike in users in each of these examples. What's not built in is, the, is that these big spikes in users uh, coincide with big, big spikes in stock price followed by reversals. So on average, these stocks are up, um, they gain about 22% compared to 10 days earlier and they lose about six to 7% of that gain uh, over the next um, over the next three weeks or four three to four weeks, so the um, pretty persistent uh, spike reversal pattern. You look at that and you might say, "Wow, if you had just um, consistently sold the day after a lot of buying, you wouldn't made a lot of money." Well, I didn't consistently sell. Uh, however, we took a look at short sellers, people you know who are. Uh, selling stocks, short interest in these stocks was way, way up around these events. So somebody was selling when the Robinhood buyers were buying, th the day after the Robinhood buyers were buying and making a lot of money. All right, that is pretty much what I have to say. Uh, my main point is that when faced with multifaceted problems or many choices, what we do and do pay attention to may have more influence on our decisions than our beliefs or our preferences. The attention of individual investors is very much directed by the media and thus it's changing as the media changes. So if you think back again, for those of, those of you who are uh, maybe closer to my generation, I grew up, there were three television stations uh, national television stations and PBS. We had four stations on TV. So an investor could watch the nightly news and at the end of the news, there'd be business news. You got your local paper. I grew up in Minnesota. So, uh, you know, I could read the St. Paul Pioneer Press or the uh, Tribune from uh, Minneapolis. Um, and there weren't a lot of sources of, of uh, there was not a lot of heterogeneity there weren't that many sources of news. Uh, now there are tremendous, there's tremendous heterogeneity. There's a lot of competition to make news exciting. When the news market was sort of captive, there was maybe less incentive for the newspapers and the television uh, stations to build, you know, to try to build more excitement. There, you know, uh, I know he wasn't the business news, but well, even Louis Rukeyser, who could be excitable, he wasn't as excitable as Jim Cramer. Uh, so the media is changing. And with that, uh, while the psychology of individual investors isn't changing, the environment in which they make decisions is changing dramatically. Thanks very much. to the audience for some questions. Um, I already see a lot come to the group chat, so thanks everyone. Um, for those who already wrote in, thank you, but feel free to add additional questions in the chat as they come through, and we'll try to do our best to get through as many as we can. Um, so Terry, the first one that came through is, investing seems to be a male-dominated field. Do you think the, ge the gender of the investor would have a meaning meaningful effect on decision-making patterns? <laughs> What's that? Uh, was that submitted by one of my co-authors? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I wrote a paper with Brad Barber oh, many years ago uh, about differences in how men and women invest. Our hypothesis was that there was evidence from psychology that men tended to be more overconfident than women particularly in domains perceived in our society to be somewhat in the, in the male domain, uh, mathematical sciences and, and you know, finance investing. Uh, and so we thought, well, in areas like that, men are likely to be more overconfident than women. And I had a theoretical model that said when investors are overconfident, they are likely to trade more and it should hurt their returns. And sure enough, we found uh, that men traded 45% more actively than women. Single men traded 67% more actively than single women. Both men and women 
underperformed a buy and hold strategy. So just to be clear, but men underperformed by one percent percentage point more a year than women did, single men by 1.4 percentage points more a year than, than single women. So yeah, there are, are differences. There is a literature on um, professional in, in investors. Um, Morningstar came out with a study uh, a year or so ago is something like one in 10 money managers are women. Uh, and there's like very few uh, money management teams that are all women. There are a lot that are all men. I have uh, have a couple of working papers um, that, that my, my co-authors and I partnered with the CFA Institute to survey their members to try to understand why more women don't choose uh, don't choose finance as a profession. Uh, you can think of several reasons why they might not, and probably all those reasons are true. Uh, one, one thing is time flexibility. Uh, if you become you know, a professional, like you, you, you become an analyst and you're hoping to become a portfolio manager, it turns out making, devoting a lot of time early in your career uh, correlates highly with how much you get paid later in your career. And it's tough for women who want to have children and who's, you know, are, if they are in a family where uh, they, you know, where the expectation is or where they and their spouse decide that, you know, the woman is going to take more time off from work, it hurts their, uh, hurts their careers. Uh, another, you know, another reason we find is that uh, women tend to, and we look cross country, across countries we find that women tend to be value pro-social activities to a larger extent than um, men. And uh, that there may be somewhat of a, a view that professional finance degrees are not as pro-social as other things that um, other careers you might choose. Thanks, Terry. So I'll go to some of the other questions. So um, John asks, uh, based on your research, could a short seller make money going against the media flow? Yes. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes. Uh, but it's an ever-changing environment. And that's the thing. That's really the thing to remember, too. You have to be able to distinguish actual phenomena from sort of spurious correlations. And then sooner or later, if it's real and there's money to be made, you won't be the only person doing it and things will change. I'm not recommending this at all. This is sort of like if you're a professional investor and you work for a hedge fund, might there be some opportunities in trading against individual investors or against these patterns? Yeah, there might be. If you're my, you know, I teach personal finance. You know, I taught behavioral finance for years. Now I'm teaching personal finance to MBA students and undergrads. Personally, I think the vast majority of investors these days, and you know, over decades, uh, the investing environment changes. But at the moment, buy and hold well-diversified, low-priced index funds. Spend your time entertaining yourself, doing something where that you enjoy. Uh, if you really like investing, put that retirement savings in that buy and hold portfolio, take something you can afford to play with and you know, have your fun without too much risk. Uh, so yes, as I say, in the paper writing about Robinhood, we document a strategy that would have made money. Uh, it's not currently, you can't implement it today because as of August, uh, Robinhood's no longer making public uh, the user changes, uh, but they do sell their order flow. So if you want to start a high speed trading firm and pay more than Citadel does for Robinhood's order flow, you can be the, on the opposite side of these trades. The next question we have is, when should we expect your Robinhood paper to be published? And do you think that because of the user or the simple interface, there are more younger investors on Robinhood and is there any age factor in investing decisions? 
Uh, yes, yes, yes. Let's see. Published? No idea. We'll have a working paper uh, posted to a website called ssrn.com, certainly within two weeks. But you know, it'll, it'll, we'll continue to work on the paper after that. Uh, I hope it's published in the next year or so, but publication can be very, um, can take a long time. That was question one. What was the second part of the question? Do you think that because of the simple interface, there's uh, yes. more you okay. investors on Robin? So what we think is the simple interface is probably one appealing to new investors because it's pretty easy to understand. You don't end up feeling that it's a very interesting phenomenon. So I teach my students that complexity is the enemy of the consumer, particularly the financial consumer. I say, look for simple products. This across the span of things. If you take a look, for example, most people who need life insurance, and certainly not everyone does need life insurance, I think should buy term life insurance. It's really simple. You find out how much you're being covered. You know, I have a million dollar policy. Uh, the terms are very simple. You're alive, you don't get paid, you die, your, your beneficiaries get paid. Cut and dry, boom, boom. Uh, make sure that, you know, the firm you buy from is financially sound, but that's relatively, you know, you can look up uh, financial ratings. Whole life and other um, cash value policies are remarkably complex, which makes it really hard to compare prices uh, and products. And there are a lot of things like that. I, I had a friend once who said to me, you know, I'm meeting with my financial advisors in a week. It's our annual phone meeting. I hate this meeting. He works in the entertainment industry and was very uncomfortable with finance. He said, I don't even know how to ask an intelligent question. I said, why don't you send me, scan and email me your portfolio, your last statement. There were 300 positions in this portfolio. There were stocks, there were bonds, there were ETFs, there were open end and closed end mutual funds. There were commodities. Uh, he had, I mean, it, it, I looked at this thing and it was tremendously confusing. And I called him up and I said, well, at least you're diversified. I don't know how well diversified because I can't make sense of this, but, um, and my feeling was very much that the firm was using complexity, making this look like rocket science so that the customer felt like, well, I could not do this myself and you, you guys take care of it. I don't understand. Robinhood flips this because now they're using simplicity and it's really simple. You go on, they'll send you, you know, I, I get alerts like this stock is doing this, this is doing this. There's a list of 20 top movers. There's a list of the most popular stocks, you know, click, 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 you buy. So if you don't want to be scared off by investing as too complex, this is a comfortable environment. It's got a little bit of gaming, gamified feel to it. You know, I, throughout the day, I'm, I, I keep getting these pushed messages telling me, oh, such and such is up 12%. Um, so, you know, it keeps you engaged. As far as age goes, yes. Uh, there's two things that go on with age. First of all, well, three things, you get older and people's attitudes towards risk change as they get older, in part because they should. You got a lot less time to, if you lose everything when you're 60, that's a lot worse than losing everything when you're 22. So there are reasons people get more conservative. You know, people have families, again, they feel a responsibility. Uh, they also have more experience. So I wrote a paper called Learning to be Overconfident with my, uh, former PhD colleague, uh, Simone Gervais, also a Haas grad. And our idea in there is we, we said, well, what if people learn about their ability through experience, but they have this bias, which is well-documented in psychology, is that when they're successful, they take credit for success. But when they fail, they blame it on bad luck in other people. Well, what we, you know, we developed a model, we said, if investors start off and some have high ability and some don't, but they're trying to figure out what their ability is from observing their own successes. And, you know, that's how we are in life. You know what? I remember 
I went to kindergarten. If you'd asked me if I was a fast runner, I would have said, I don't know. You know, within two years, I could have assured you I was not a fast runner because when we raced across the schoolyard, I was looking at the back of other people. And about the same amount of time, I started to figure out that I understood arithmetic better than a lot of you know, my, my other students. So you start to learn about yourself. So in our model, investors are learning about themselves through successes and failures, but they're taking their successes too much to heart and they become overconfident. And successful investors become overconfident. They do have more ability, but not as much as they think they have. And young successful investors tend to be more overconfident. When I used to present that paper, I would quip that the last person I would wanna hand my money to is an inexperienced young hedge fund manager who's just had a string of successes because he's convinced he's a genius. And I don't want uh, a self, you know, someone who thinks they're a genius running my money. Thanks, Terry. The next question is also a multi-stage question. <laughs> so uh, do you think the market volatility around the pandemic is unique? And what patterns does it follow? Does it change individual investor behavior or does it just fall under media coverage? There's been a lot of volatility. Um, I assume there'll be periods of high volatility again. There have been in the past. Uh, this is very volatile. You know, wars give you a lot of volatility. Uh, but um, actually, something that is very different, though, here from, say, a war, you could get a lot of volatility. But what's changed, what's been unusual with COVID is there was a big surge of investing by individual investors. There, I don't know why. There's been speculation. Some of the speculation is, well, everyone was home. Uh, there wasn't much to do. Um, and then the market went down, and when it recovered, there's an old Wall Street adage that says, don't confuse brains with a bull market. But we currently have a lot of genius investors. Uh, so yeah, that aspect, um, and during, just to fill out the other side of it, uh, during wars, trading tended to go down because people were busy with other things. They weren't at home. The lowest trading, the year with the lowest trading in all of the last century was 1943. The, you know, the people who would have been trading were elsewhere. Uh, so yeah, I think that the lockdown and the sharp recovery of the market, which was at least in part due to um, the activity by the Fed and the, and, and the stimulus bill, uh, probably got a lot of people excited about investing and, and more active in investing. And you get a lot of new investors and that's what Robin Hood's been picking up. How much does it affect markets? I don't know on the big, on, on the, on, for the big, the large cap stocks, I don't know. And I would think not hugely. For the small cap stocks, the things that the Robin Hood traders are trading, it makes a difference. Yeah, it adds a lot of volatility. Thanks, Terry. So I think this is our final question. We have about a minute left. This is from Douglas. Thank you, Douglas. Um, anticipating the returns from an ESG index versus general stock market index, what, which category will institutional investors buy more of in five years? Uh, well, I don't know the answer. So I might as well tell you what I don't know. Two thoughts on that. Probably... It's a little complicated, but for those of you who remember things like constraints, in theory, there's no reason that I know of why an ESG portfolio should outperform an unconstrained portfolio because the manager of the unconstrained portfolio can always choose the ESG portfolio if she thinks it's going to have better performance. In practice, things don't quite work like that. I wouldn't be surprised to see institutional managers buying ESG portfolios, but not because of anticipating dramatically or substantially better performance, but because that's what the clients want. I think more and more investors are realizing 
that there is a social responsibility to investing. Someone has to take responsibility for what the firm does. And you know, to some extent, business schools contributed to a culture which is now changing. And Haas is, I think, at the forefront of this change. But business schools contributed to this business culture where you walked into a corporate finance class and you were told the sole responsibility of the CEO is to increase shareholder value. And it, it, it ignored any social responsibility of the company. Someone has to take social responsibility for what the company does. And more and more, I think a lot of investors are realizing, hey, maybe I should do that. Great. Well, thank you again, Terry, for sharing your time and knowledge with us today. Um, I thought your research was really interesting and we really appreciate you being here with us. Um, and thank you for those who tuned in this morning. So we're going to be returning in about 30 minutes for another lecture with Haas professor Ming Xu. And Ming will be discussing uh, measuring brand equity inside the mind of the consumer. And go Bears! <laughs> go Bears! <laughs>